This morning we began a new journey, began a new series that is about growing faith in our life, learning how to trust God. And the pathway for the journey is going to be Hebrews chapter 11. That chapter is called the faith chapter because in that chapter we learn so much about what it means to approach God from a faith context. And that is going to be the center of everything that we talk about in the next several weeks. So how about turning to Hebrews chapter 11? It might be that you're not quite sure how to get there. Many of you already know how to get to Hebrews 11. But in case you don't, here's what you do. Close your Bible. You go all the way to the end of your Bible. Go all the way, like there's the flap at the end. Make a left, go through the maps, and through the concordance, and come to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you're going to go eight more books. But look, some of those books only are like one page, so don't cut too far into it. Go eight books. You're going to see John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You're going to see Peter, 1st, 2nd Peter. You're going to see James. And there is Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. In this series, we're going to learn what faith is and what faith is not. Sometimes people use the word faith in a context that is very different from how the Bible uses it. We're going to learn how to grow in this area of faith. We're going to learn uh, a little bit more about how it is that we discern the will of God. And this is so important. We just came out of a series, Where is God in My Pain? And one of the big aspects of that series is coming to understand God's will in situations that we face. So as we go through this series, we're going to deal with that very concept. How do you better understand the will of God? How do you detect the voice of God? I don't mean an audible voice. I mean that voice in your heart. How do you hear the voice of God? How do you come to better understand the grace of God, the mercy of God, the character of God? We're going to be dealing with all these things, and we're dealing with them because they will help us to learn how to be more productive in our Christian life, more successful in living the kind of life that God has called us to live. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the just shall live by faith. And the Bible defines the just as being those who have come to know Christ as Savior, whom he has justified in his sight. And he says, look, if you know God, if you've given your heart to Christ, I want you to learn how to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So that's what we're going to be doing. Oftentimes, many of you in this room take notes, and there they are, right there, fill in the blanks, and right there in your worship guide. But even if you don't usually take notes, would you take notes today? Would you trust me at the beginning? you to have a little faith in me, I guess. At the very beginning, and maybe take notes this time, because when we get toward the middle to the end of the message, I'm going to be dealing with a whole lot of things very quickly, and I want you to fill in those blanks so you can go back and look, because I'm going to be talking about something that, that might be new in, in understanding. And so the notes will be helpful today. Now, when we get started in, in Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, the very first point is so easily understood out of verse 1 that faith is believing in a promise God has made to me even though it's not a current reality. So look at what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of of things not seen. Now, we're going to take these two phrases, separate them, break them down, and have a better understanding because from it, we will glean what is real faith in the eyes of God. Faith, first of all, is the assurance of things hoped for. Circle the word assurance and circle the word hoped. I've said to you several times in the past that the word hope, in the way it's used today, is so different than how it is used in the Bible. The way we use hope today is hope so. I hope it happens. I'm just not sure it will. Hope the weather's good. Hope thy team wins. It is a hope so kind of thing. But when the Bible uses the word hope, it is no so. Not hope so, but no so. The word hope in the Bible means something that God has promised to come to pass. God gives you a promise 
So now you can know with total confidence that it's going to happen. That's the way the word hope is used in the Bible. That's why Paul would reference to hope as my hope is sure because it's a no-so kind of thing. I've gotten a promise from God. I can trust God. So God gives to us this promise, and he says, latch on to the promise because it is definitely going to come. Then look at the word assurance. 11 verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The word assurance in the, is in the Greek language means a guarantee that you will receive what God has promised you. It's a guarantee. It's in the bank. It is an absolute that you're going to get it. This is the power of faith. This is why Jesus said, look, you don't have to have a lot of faith. You can have the faith of a mustard seed, just a teeny little seed. It's not the amount of faith you have. It is the object that your faith is in. That's the issue about faith. Your faith makes you the owner of what God says he wants to give to you. There are some things that God says, I want to give this to you. There's no faith. I'm not going to trust God. And so we don't get it. But God said, I would have wanted to give this to you. The issue is, I'll give this to you on the basis of your faith. There's a second phrase then. It's this. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. Now, circle the word conviction and the phrase things not seen. The Bible teaches us that faith is seeing the future in the present. As Manly Beasley, a guy that I deeply love, said to me many years ago, he said, faith is believing that something is so when it's not so in order that it might become so. It is seeing something not in the present but in the future. Faith is having a conviction that something is going to happen even though it hasn't happened yet It is seeing it in advance. In some respects, we use the word vision for this very same kind of concept. In 1960, JFK, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, JFK, in his inaugural address said, I see the day by the end of this decade that we will be able to put a man safely on the moon and bring him safely home. I'm going to tell you, I'm sure those people that were listening to this, especially the scientists and NASA that was listening to this, must have wondered, what? There was no technology capable of doing that, and there was no sense of, okay, we're on the verge of anything like this. He simply laid out a vision of something that did not exist, and in their mind couldn't exist in time, to exist by the end of the decade. And can you believe it? By the end of that decade, we had already put four men on the moon and brought them safely home. And by 1972, another eight Americans on the moon and brought them safely home. 39 years ago, there was just a handful of people from this church who said, God is leading us to plant a church on this site. There was no church here. They said, we just really believe that God wants a church called Sugar Creek Baptist Church. And so they left their churches and they came here to start a church. They believed in their heart that God would grow a strong church and a regional church and a church that would impact all of this area. And look now, 39 years later, what God has raised up. But he raised this up because of the faith of a handful of people that said, God, we believe you've impressed this on our heart. One year ago, a handful of people, a group of people left this church, said, we really believe God wants us to help begin another site of Sugar Creek at Siena Plantation, and we are willing to leave all the amenities of this building property, this location, and and, and everything this location has, and we will go out in pioneers, and we will begin a new site called Sugar Creek, Siena, and they did one year ago. And over the span of this last year, amazingly enough, there, it averaged somewhere between 300 to 350. And last Sunday, the one-year birthday of this site, they had 490 people in attendance that day. And it's just amazing what has happened here, what God raised up. It was faith. It was a, 
a, a willingness to see that something before it happens and to trust God with a promise that he has given to us. In all of these things, I want you to grab hold of that faith is always tied to a direct promise from God. Biblical faith is not presumption. It's not walking on thin ice. It's not going out on a limb. And so many times we Christians use it that way, but it's not appropriate. It's not right. It's not what the Bible teaches. Faith isn't just doing something crazy. Well, we need to have faith that, that about this. Yes, but if God hasn't told us to do it, we're not having faith. We're having presumption on God. Faith is not wishful thinking or even positive thinking. Faith is trusting in a promise that God has given to me. Where God takes a promise from his word and he latches that promise onto you. This is my promise for you. Now, I believe that promise that God has made and I act on it and my faith guarantees that it comes to pass. This is what God is asking. This is the kind of life that God is calling us to. And this is what faith is. It's this kind of faith that Mark, these great people of the Old Testament, Noah, and Abraham, Sarah, Ruth, David, Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Esther, all of these men and women in the Old Testament, this was the kind of faith that moved them to seeing incredible, wonderful things happen in their life. And for some of them, it wasn't an incredible miracle that happened. In fact, some of them, they gave their lives. But they trusted God. They knew this is what God had told them to do. This was the promise he had given to them and direction he had given them. And they said yes to God. Now God is saying to you and me, I want to teach you how to live this kind of faith. The just shall live by faith. I want to show you how to live on a different dimension. I want to show you how to gain the understanding of what I'm telling you to do and then have the courage to do it and then see me intersect your life. It may very well be that you and I might not have just overwhelming talent in our life, but we can learn how, learn how to have overwhelming faith. Faith is learned. It's not automatic, it's learned. And in the process of this series, that is what we're after. This is what God is calling us to do. This is why then Hebrews chapter 11 verse 2 says this, and this is what the ancients were commended for, this kind of faith. So as the Bible op opens up in this passage of Scripture in Hebrews 11, it shows us what faith is and what faith is not. And now it begins to show us, tell us, what are some of the areas in which I want you to demonstrate faith? And here's the first one. God created our universe. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. The Bible clearly teaches us that the universe and everything that was in it, that's in it, all came from the command of God, and all that we see came from what cannot be seen. That in itself is an amazing statement. I believe that with all my heart, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God created it all. Today, Bible-believing Christians hold the same view. Some are called young earth who believe that the universe is somewhere between six to 10,000 years old, and some are old earth creationists who believe that the universe is very very old. Both of these positions, young and old earth, are held by godly men and women who deserve our respect and our love. For instance, John MacArthur is one of my favorite of all time uh, commentary writers and theologians, and he is a young earth proponent. James Dobson, a focus on the family, Charles Col Colson, two men that I greatly admire and respect, are old earth proponents. So what I, I did is I spent one year going through this two years ago and saying, well, which one is it? Old earth, young earth. And so I spent a ton of time not listening to what one person said about their opponents or about somebody who holds a different view, but listening to original sources on both sides. I really want to understand you can't believe the amount of books I read, the videos I watched, the people I listened to, the debates that I, I walked through. 
I wanted to understand. I also wanted to understand another thing, not just what both sides teach, but I got to wondering, what is this, a recent phenomena? Or have we been debating this issue for a long time? I went back to the writings that are called the early church fathers, all the way back to the beginning of the second century. And to my amazement, I began to discover almost in every generation, it seemed, there was a patristic writer, a early church father writer, who talked about old earth as well as one or more talked about young earth. And to my shock, this debate did not begin in the 20th century. This debate began in the 2nd century. And it's been going on all along. But all the while that it has been, there has always been an attitude of respect for each other holding different views. All of them, all of them, an attitude of respect toward each other. Now listen. What I did is I put everything that I learned, an explanation of old earth, young earth, an explanation of the strengths and weaknesses and all of that stuff in a paper. I wrote the paper, so it, you know, it's not great because I wrote it, but it's got information that can help you sort through all these things and go back to second century and hear what some of these guys said all through the first 1,000, 1,500 years. It's on the website in Siena, the website front page in, at Sugar Creek or Sugar Land. Go and look at it and spend some time and understand the issues related to this. But whatever side, old earth or young earth, that maybe you hold to, Bible-believing Christians do agree about this, that God with a command created what we see now in the universe from what could not be seen. You know what? One part of what happened in my, in my study, I discovered that around 40%, it was over 40, 40 something, 43 or 4, percent of all American scientists today are Christians. Did you know that? Who believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, and hold that to be true? That is a real surprise for many people because. We always hear the other side of that, but the truth is, in my research, I discovered there is a ton of Christians who are scientists who believe in creation and are scientists in our country. So, when we think about creation, we cannot help but in our culture to also think about evolution. So, what about evolution? I want to talk to you about this for just a few moments, and I've got something that I think of real importance for us to talk about about this issue. First of all, I want to make a statement. I want you to fill in the blank on this statement. The lead pastor of Sugar Creek Baptist Church, who's me, is a creationist, not an evolutionist. I believe in creation. I have no question whatsoever about it. But here's, well, okay. Okay. But here's what I want to say to you. What might surprise some is that three of the major issues related to this topic, creationists and evolutionists actually agree on. There are five major sections of biological evolution. These three of these sections easily fit into a biblical creationist world view for both young and old earth creationists. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because I think there's some misunderstanding. I'm doing this on the behalf of parents that are in the room. As your children go start going into science classes and that sort of thing and start bringing them, well, the whole idea of evolution, that you can be able to speak intelligently about this issue and drill down a little bit deeper. I'm saying these things, sharing this with you for those who are high school students, middle school and college students that are dealing with this, so that you get an idea, an understanding that maybe, maybe you did not understand before. What I am trying to do is help all of us in the room today work through what sections of evolution fit and what do not fit a biblical perspective. So let's take a look first of all, is microevolution. Creationists don't call it that. Creationists call it like-kind genetic diversity. 
because that is the description of what it is. But both of those terms mean exactly the same thing, cell adaptation and mutation within a species, meaning God created the horse, and the horse, through cell adaptation, has moved from Shetland Pony to Clydesdales, but they're still a horse, and they can still interbreed with each other. This does not contradict the biblical creation model at all. You talk to anyone, old earth, young earth, and they'll tell you, this fits a biblical worldview. It's called, at least in evolution, microevolution, a change within the species. Second of all is microbial evolution, and this is, creationists call this, like-kind genetic diversity in single-cell organisms. It's a longer term, but they don't want to use the word evolution because they don't want to give a misrepresentation. But creationists understand and believe that there is cell mutation that happens within single cell organisms as they are trying to avoid extinction by antibiotics or whatever, and it totally fits within a biblical worldview. God created the single cell, and then it changes, but that does not violate a biblical creationist worldview, microbial evolution. The third area is called speciation, and speciation creationists call an advanced form of like-kind genetic diversity. Speciation is a very confusing thing. It takes a little bit of time to work with and far more time than I have today. But it is talking about an advanced form of microevolution in which a species in one part of the world makes different changes than the same species in another part of the world. And though they are part of the same species, they cannot now procreate with each other. But yet in a biblical worldview, I mean, I, I checked in both old earth and young earth, in both of those creationist models, see speciation as fitting a biblical creation model. Now some of you are saying, you know, I, what is going on here? What is this, science class? What, what have we walked into here? Here's what I'm wanting us to understand. Within the creation truth that God made it all, there are three concepts that have been adopted by the vast majority of creationists and evolutionists alike. Generally speaking, though especially speciation, there's some, some qualifiers with it, but generally speaking in these three areas, we do not have a conflicting view. I have some, from time to time uh, uh, students and whomever come into my office and say, you know, I'm really concerned. I, I'm learning about evolution. It's just right. And, I, and I, my answer is, okay, well, tell me what parts of evolution you're talking about. What do you mean? And it usually comes down to microevolution. And I'll say, well, that, we don't have a problem with that as creationists. Or microbial, we don't have a problem with that. Well, then what is the problem? Why do creationists reject the theory of evolution? It is primarily because of the last two areas of biological evolution, which are still nothing more than scientific theory, and we believe wrong theory. So what are these two? The first is macroevolution. It is the theory that suggests that one kind can mutate into another kind, such as a dog becomes a horse becomes an elephant. Now that is an exaggeration, and I tell you that up front. But it is the concept, it is the concept of one kind becoming a totally different kind. This concept has been adopted by evolutionists and has been assumed because, why? Of the validity of microevolution. Well, we don't have a problem with microevolution, but you can't take that and immediately assume macroevolution because macroevolution is a violation of truth. There has not been proven fossil records that demonstrates macroevolution and creationists do not accept it. What's interesting to me is that Darwin made a statement in his life as he was 
pushing the, his new theory, that within the next 100 years, there will be millions of fossil examples of mutation between one, series, one species to a second one, but it's been 150 years and there still aren't any. There should be millions by now, if it were true. In science books, what do you see? You see artist renderings is what you see. And the artist renderings, okay, there is an ape mo- turning into a man. But there have not been the fossil demonstrations of that happening. It is an artist rendering that is based upon assumption, not fact. Chemical evolution is the next. Chemical evolution is the theory of life evolving from inorganic matter, from non-life to life. In other words, a a rock turning into a living thing or a, a collection of molecules coming together creating a living organism. This concept has been adopted by evolutionists but is a product of assumption not scientifically proven at all. In fact, it violates several scientific laws, and creationists do not accept it. The issue is macro and chemical. I viewed a a 17-week, and I do this all the time. I'm taking courses all the time. And most, many times, it's history courses or or obviously uh, theological courses. But I decided last fall to take a 17-week video course entitled Origins of Life, taught by Professor Robert Hazen, who's a professor of science at George Mason University. And the the central core of the 17-week video series was about to, was explaining chemical evolution. I wanted to better understand this concept. What do we really understand? What have we really proven about this? And I wanted to hear it not from a creationist telling me somebody's point of view. I wanted to hear it from an evolutionist. Professor Hazen does believe in in evolution. He isn't a Christian, the best I could could deduce. And I thought he did a great job on the course. I really did. I loved it. I really enjoyed the course. He's a great communicator. But in the course, he admitted many times, many times, that there are major problems with the evolutionary theory in the realm of chemical evolution simply because it violates so many scientific laws. I mean, he was very open and honest about that, which I deeply appreciated. And this is a direct quote from him that I just thought was astounding. He made this statement, even the simplest living cell is complex beyond anything we could imagine. Every cell depends upon the interplay of millions of molecules engaged in hundreds of interdependent chemical reactions. And here's the statement, continuing. I think it's very possible that the human brain isn't wired in such a way to even be able to comprehend this multidimensional complexity. Thank you. I mean, thank you for being honest about this. Thank you for this, because this was an honest statement on his part, and it's true. And it is this very reason that there are so many scientists, like the brilliant Stephen Meyer. Steve, Stephen Meyer is the founder of Discovery Institute. It is, the, it is that branch that is uh, propagating the intelligent design movement. And Stephen Meyer is a brilliant scientist an accomplished scientist. He's the founder of Discovery Institute. He, he wrote two incredible books. Oh, you ought to get the book. They're hard. One of them is called Signature in the Cell. It's in the bookstore. And he takes the cell, just the single cell, and he demonstrates how impossible it would have been for it to just happen. And he walks through it from a scientific perspective. He's just come out with another book called Darwin's Dilemma, in which he points out so many predictions of Darwin that simply haven't borne true. And in fact, exactly the opposite. The creationist model is what is being borne true. And here's what he says, Stephen Meyer. Stephen Meyer, by the way, is a committed Christian, committed follower of Christ. He says... That the single cell is God's undeniable fingerprint that undeniably points to God. Professor Hazen said that because life violates so many scientific laws that 
Many in the scientific community believe that there must be a missing scientific law, and it has been dubbed emergence. And I worked hard at trying to put the, what is emergence and, and explain it. He was struggling to understand and explain it, and he's a professor in this realm, in this area. But he said, why does the emergence of life violate both laws of thermodynamics and so many other scientific laws? There must be another law that's missing. And so many times in the course, I laughed out loud and said, there is. It's called intelligent design. It's called God. It's called a designer God that changed the normal outcome of those laws of thermodynamics and created life from non-life. I'm going to tell you something. When we, we get this idea that all scientists are just sort of benign, they just go with the flow, whatever. It's not true. Even for scientists, it's not as much a battle of science as it is a battle of worldviews. All of us bring worldviews into the discussion. Even scientists on both sides of that equation, God or no God. Last summer, and the science part's almost over, so hang with me. Last summer, I heard a podcast debate between two biologists, accomplished biologists, one a creationist and one an evolutionist. And it was a great debate where they dealt with so many of the issues, and I th you get to hear both sides kind of thing, and it was just, it was fantastic. And in the midst of the debate, the creationist biologist made this statement. He said, look, creationists have no problem with microevolution, no problem with microbial evolution, no problem with speciation within limits. Where we part ways is in macroevolution because we both know that there is weak and insignificant evidence to prove macroevolution. What was interesting to me is the evolutionist biologist did not push back on that. He didn't challenge that statement. And we both know that every experiment designed to prove chemical evolution has failed. Every one. The reason is because the evidence points to a creator. Now, the evolutionist biologist said this, well, that is just the God in the gaps right there. And then he said this, if you give science enough time, it will solve this problem. To which the, biology, the creationist biologist said, then we both have God in the gaps, don't we? My God is Jehovah God, your God is science. And we both have God in the gaps. But the truth is, there is far more evidence for a creator than not. And here's what he then said. He said, but I will tell you what I'll do in this debate. I will give it to you. One day science will finally come together and bring all the ingredients together and be able to create life out of non-life. He said, I don't believe it, but he said, I will give it to you. But the very moment it does, it only proves my point. It took all these years and an incredible intellect to be able to finally accomplish non-life into life, and all they will be doing is demonstrating intelligent design. That's all they'll be doing. He said, there is no way to work your way around this issue. As creationists, our greatest struggle is when evolution insists that the universe is undirected. Most every science book and science museum proclaims that the universe came into being undirected. But that statement cannot be proven scientifically. Yet it is stated religiously. And its purpose is to close the discussion about God. This is a worldview issue, not a science issue. But i got to tell you something, God will not go away. God won't ever go away. Now, the science lesson's done. Yay, God. God created our universe. And the Bible has taught from the very beginning that the universe had a beginning. And that it came from nothing. 
from what cannot be seen. Science for hundreds of years has laughed at Christians who believe that. Because the prevailing scientific position was that the universe has always been. That's the Carl Sagan thing. It's always been, always will be. It was constant. But in the middle of the 20th century, it was discovered that's not true at all. And out of an understanding now, scientifically, that proof that there was a beginning, the Big Bang cosmology, suddenly science has changed to align with what the Bible said all along. There was a beginning, and it, all of this came from what cannot be seen. The last holdout was Albert Einstein in the mid-1900s. Because Albert Einstein realized that if there was a beginning, there had to be a beginner. And he held out almost to his death, but before 1955 when he died, he finally surrendered and said, I give in. It is obvious there was a beginning to the universe. Guess who discovered the evidence, scientific evidence, for the beginning of the universe? It was a scientist who is a Christian. Even Greek philosophy, every other religion, believed that the universe was constant. The only significant worldview that has taught that the universe had a beginning is the worldview based upon Genesis 1.1. And I defy you to find anything to the contrary, because you won't. Isn't it interesting that only the Bible got it right? Only the Bible got it right. To have a beginning requires a beginner. It is called, called an uncaused first cause. This is what Hebrews 11.3 is saying. Listen to it again. By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, and what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. This is an incredibly scientifically accurate statement. So how did the Bible know? Psalm 33 verse 6 says this, By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of His mouth. Let all the earth fear Yahweh, and let all the people of the world revere Him. For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. God continues to be involved in His creation. There is a God. He is transcendent, meaning He stands apart and separate from His creation. He has unimaginable intelligence and power. He revealed Himself through His creation, through the design of the universe. All of it was pointing to Him. It is so well-tuned that it would not only support life, but it would point us to Him. It's like a megaphone yelling to us. He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin so that you and I could finally know Him and have a relationship with Him. This is truth. This faith journey begins by understanding what faith is and begins and then the next step is to understand everything that I know everything that is everything that will be comes from one creator God who ordered it and brought it into being I want to ask you a question have you come to know this creator God have you come to receive Him as your Savior? Have you, have you come to accept Him and come to now, come to, to start that journey of knowing Him? Of knowing Him. I want to invite you this morning to take the leap of faith and come and receive Him as your Savior. Let's pray.